So we can almost understand when this girl gives birth as a teenager and abandons her baby in an alley. Hurt people, hurt people. It's what we say when parents abuse, neglect, or abandon their own children. As human beings, we are driven to make sense of our world even when it doesn't make sense. We need something to hang on to, some kind of mooring to keep us upright when so much of our world seems to be out of control. We need something to say so that we don't just scream out in rage. <clears throat> As true as this adage can be, and as good as it makes us feel to kind of make sense out of things, it also does an injustice to a whole group of people. What about hurt people who don't hurt people? People who have somehow managed to escape from the grip of their pain. He was a little boy growing up in rural North Dakota. The town, so small, you could stand at the main intersection, look both ways, and see the entire thing. Being on the plains meant that the winds just whipped through the small community, rattling doors and windows and the houses and one-room schoolhouse. His mother worked at the general store, and his father was the grain elevator operator. The little boy himself seemed to think it was his job to perfect his rock-throwing skills, and he did so by regularly knocking out all the streetlights in the town. <laughs> he might have been any little boy growing up in a small town. But this little boy did not come home to a pa and aunt B kind of life. He came home to a violently alcoholic father. And to a mother who escaped by simply not coming home. So often not even telling the little boy and his sister when she would be home to care for them, to protect them. Many years later, his mother escaped from the doors, and when they were grown, the boy and his sister ran far, far away. From there, and even from each other, still today living on two separate U.S. coasts, as though to stretch the hurting ties that bind just as far as humanly She was a little girl, growing up in a nice North Carolina town, the kind of town where all the streets are lined with trees and everybody goes to the country club for Sunday brunch. It was perfect at first. Her parents were so excited for her to be born. She was their first and the apple of their eye, followed five years later by another beautiful baby girl, followed by tragedy the untimely death of their young and beloved mother. Well, it was a day when it was acceptable for men to pretty much shrug their shoulders at child-rearing at all, much less single parenting, and of two little girls. Well, it just made sense for him to give them up for adoption. And their aunt and uncle so desperately wanted to start a family anyway. It should have been a great situation. Unfortunately for the little girl, her new mother only wanted the baby. The truth that was raining down on her every day of her life. Sometimes in subtle ways. Coming down on Christmas morning and finding a second-hand bicycle next to her sister's shiny new one. But usually it wasn't that subtle. She endured degradations and abuses just because she existed. During college, she received an opportunity to go far away from home. And she took it. And she moved to North Dakota, where she met a little boy who wasn't so little anymore, but who was working his way through college in a Fargo drugstore, which is where she met him. A few years later, they were married. They decided to start a family. This is how it starts. Adults who were badly parented, have children. They have no idea through their own circumstances how to nurture children, how to raise them in a safe and loving home. Hurt people hurt people. It seemed bound to turn out badly. The couple had three 
children. The boy, now a man, now a father, never did get drunk and abuse or neglect his family. The girl, now a woman, now a mother, never did favor one child above another or hurt her children through inhumane treatment. As it turns out, my parents are loving and lovable people. Not perfect, but good parents. Now it could have something to do with the angelic disposition of their eldest. <laughs> we'll never know. Somehow, these two hurt people took what could have been a legacy of pain and turned it into a family that I and my siblings are lucky to be part of. Hurt people sometimes hurt people, but sometimes hurt people don't. Sometimes they stop. You see, 
I had been working every day after school as a busboy over at Chuck Cavallini's restaurant for over a year, spending most of my time fantasizing about Kathy Instone, the most beautiful salad girl that ever worked. <laughs> I used to dream of going on dates with her. But of course, nothing like that, like that ever happened because I was deathly afraid to get anywhere near her for fear that my nerdiness would somehow destroy her great beauty. <laughs> I never went on dates because every single penny that I earned went right into the bank for my college fund. My plan was to get a degree in physics and then win the Nobel Prize for inventing a new form of energy that would completely revolutionize mankind. The plans had changed. I was going to be a rock star now. So, after school, I went to the bank and I pulled out all my money. And I bought a bass guitar, an amplifier, a PA system, and began to learn songs like Louie Louie, Jumping Jack Flash, and Anna Gata De Vida. <laughs> By the time summer rolled around, we were good enough to enter the Battle of the Bands contest over at St. Christopher's Church. But I didn't just want to enter. <laughs> I wanted to win. And to win, I really needed a little something extra, something that none of the other bands had. So one day I was listening to the radio and I heard Blood, Sweat, and Tears, which was a group that combined horns with rock music. And I knew that this was the sound that could push us over the top. So I called up a couple of my nerd friends from the high school marching band and I recruited a trumpet player and a trombonist. And we began to learn songs by Chicago, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and the ultimate horn song, Vehicle, by the Ides of March. <laughs> <laughs> On the day of the contest, we were ready. Of the eight bands that entered, ours was selected to perform last. So, after having to wait around and listen to seven versions of Louie Louie, <laughs> seven versions of Jumping Jack Flash, and seven versions of Inagata De Vida, we walked on stage. As I look out into the audience, I noticed that nobody was paying attention. Everyone was busy talking to their friends. I thought, who am I kidding? I'm no rock star. I'm just a nerd. Just then the drummer started off. One, two, three, four, and the horns kicked in. Da 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 da. <laughs> and I started singing. I'm the friendly stranger in the black sedan who hop inside my car. Everybody in the audience stopped what they were doing, turning around, and began to stare at us as if we were aliens from another planet. <laughs> I knew that Einstein's theory of relativity was true because on that day, those 15 minutes on stage felt like 15 seconds. And when our last notes flew out of our speakers and slammed into people's ears, we walked off stage to a standing ovation. <laughs> As I was putting my bass guitar back into its case, I felt the presence of someone standing next to me. I looked up, and there... She looked so beautiful. And for the first time ever, she spoke to me. <laughs> and she said, John, your band sounds great. Say, I'm having a party at my house next Saturday night. Do you want to come? <laughs> it was at that moment that I realized that I was respected. I was admired, and I was cool. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> if any of you here tonight ever feel insecure, for whatever reason, perhaps you may feel that you're not as attractive <coughs> As you would like to be. Or perhaps you may feel that you're not as talented <coughs> as you would like to be. We really wish that you could be cool. Well, let me inform you right now that you already are just don't realize. Mr. Tosin.
Contestant number three, Brett Larson. Where did that come from? Where did that come from, Brett Larson? Question of the day. Who can tell me what's the standard sign, usually in comic books and cartoons, what's the standard sign to show that somebody has a good idea? Light bulb. Light bulb over your head. Right? For some of you, if you haven't seen it before, let me give you an idea of what it's like. <laughs> okay, I now have a light bulb over my head. Does that mean I have a lot of good ideas? No. Maybe putting a light bulb over my head was not a good idea. <laughs> Fellow Toastmasters and guests, if having a light bulb over your head doesn't mean you automatically have good ideas, where do good ideas come from? Good ideas can come from everybody's mind. And in fact, that's important because research shows that one of the drivers of job satisfaction is feeling you contribute to your job. And what a great way to contribute to your job by giving good ideas. But how do you get good ideas? It's actually quite simple. Just imagine the unimaginable. Okay, <coughs> sounds a little easier to say than what it is to do, but, but where do you get good ideas? Fortunately for us, good ideas are not limited by socioeconomic status, by college education, <coughs> by pay, or by age, or especially not by age. <laughs> kids, kids have the greatest ideas in the world. To kids, nothing is impossible. They're not limited by what they know can't be done. They think they can do anything. They just have to figure out how to do it. For example, when I was about eight years old, I like to stay up late at night and read. My parents thought I should go to bed at a certain time, so every night my dad would come up and he'd shut the light off in my room and go back downstairs. One night I thought I'd outsmart him. I got out of bed. I walked across the room. And just as I was reaching for the light switch, I heard, Brad, get back in bed and leave the light on. <coughs> I had a problem. <coughs> my bed was right over my parents and the floor squeaked. Oh. So, as a kid, I had to figure out how can I get the light on without them knowing about it. Kids can do anything, so I, I found something like this. The way this works is you take a light bulb, screw it into the socket, screw this into your socket and your light in the room, and then you can pull the chain, the light goes on and off. I tied a long string to this, ran the string across the ceiling, <laughs> over the curtain rod, down the wall, and tied it to my bedpost. So that night, when I went to bed, I was reading, I heard the downstairs door open, my dad started to come upstairs, I just reached up, pulled the chain, the light went off, I pretended to be asleep, my dad came up, opened the door, there was angelic brats. <laughs> <laughs> my dad went back downstairs, I reached up, pulled the light, I was back reading again. So ideas can come about when people have to solve a dire emergency like I did. Sometimes, Good ideas come up by chance. For those of you in the front, can you tell the people what I have in my hand here? Can you tell what it is? It's a little carrot, right? For those of you who may not be as old as me, I want to tell you something. Carrots did not always look like this. <laughs> Carrots used to look like this. <laughs> you go to the store, and you buy carrots like this, you take them home, clean them off, cut them into four or five carrot sticks. I understand that nobody ever wanted the little scrubby carrots before. In fact, they used to throw them away or grind them up for feed for livestock. <laughs> One day, somebody threw all the little stubby carrots into the grinder and it went round and around and around, but something was wrong with the grinder and it didn't grind them up. It just rolled them around and around. So when they opened up the door, afterwards, the grinder, they found a bunch of little carrots and the friction had cleaned off all the dirt and rounded off all the edges and somebody curious mind said, hey, that kind of looks like a carrot stick. So they said, I wonder if anybody would buy these things like this. So they packaged them up and sold them. And I understand now that was once, what was once garbage now outsells what was the original desired product. <laughs> Good ideas can come about for many, many reasons. Sometimes they come about because people want to save energy. 
probably all know what this is. It's a can of furniture polish. How do you use furniture polish? Well, it's easy. Just take a rag, spray the furniture polish on the rag, or spray it on the table, polish the table, and voila! You have a shiny new table. But somebody figured out that's way too much work. <laughs> sell rags with furniture polish already on them. <laughs> All you do is open it up. Rags got furniture polish on it. Whoa, what a beautiful shine. <laughs> so we've seen over the last few minutes that good ideas can come about for all kinds of reasons from all kinds of places. And we've heard that if you have good ideas, you can actually like your job better. So how do you get good ideas? How many times have you said, if this was my job, if I controlled this, we'd do it this way? The good news is, you can do it this way. You can do it the way you want to, by just having curiosity and seeing what's going on in the world around you and how you can make it better and easier. The jobs don't have to be great. The ideas don't have to be fantastic. They can be as simple as packaging a product differently, as simple as eliminating the need to spray a rag, or even as basic as eliminating the need to get out of bed to turn the light off. Really easy. Imagine the unimaginable. British writer Samuel Johnson said, curiosity is the constant characteristic of a vigorous mind. We all have vigorous minds, and we all have curiosity. The difference is that someone, maybe someone in this room, will be the next person to take an idea and develop it. We're only limited by the limits we place on ourselves. And we just have to remember to let the light bulb go off in our head rather than over our head. Mr. Contest Manager. Contestant number four, Diane Bolan, just four little words, just four little words, Diane Bolan. suspicions, opinions, or theories, we hold these truths, indisputable facts, the heart of the matter. 
We hold these truths also. He didn't say, well, we're going to try it out and see how it goes. No, no, we hold them. In the 17th century, things were very different. If you were to hold an opinion that didn't agree with the crowd, it was the age of guillotine. It was the age of let them eat cake and off with their heads. <laughs> the gentleman who signed the document that begins with those four little words were putting their lives, the lives of their children, all of their holdings at risk because we hold these truths. We hold these truths to be sacred and indisputable. Oh yeah, you didn't get that word, did you? Ben Franklin, John Adams, they didn't like the sacred part, you know, that church and state thing? So it became, we hold these truths to be self-evident. In that century, self, with a capital S, was a scholar's code word for soul. It was a way to bring the spiritual into the document without there being any confusion about church. We hold these truths to be evident when you go into that deep, still, small voice within yourself, you know that each and every human, I'm going to update for this century, that all humankind, my inner feminista makes me do that, all humankind <laughs> are created equal. But wait a minute, that isn't true either. Because if we were all created equal, <laughs> I'd look like Angelina Jolie <laughs> and have Oprah's bank account. <laughs> no, the Founding Fathers, when they put those words together, they said all men are created equal, meaning that the process of our humanity is identical for each of us. We all start out there somewhere in the ethers, as it was called in the 1700s, and then spark our soul, however it happens, through the patience through the grace and the labor of another human, we arrive fully formed and completely vulnerable. And each of us must meet the challenge of learning how to live within this body thing and learn how to talk and communicate despite the conditions of our family, despite the conditions of our culture, we all have to face learning how to communicate, learning how to step forward, learning how to feed ourselves, the human process is the same, regardless of prince or pauper. And in this process, you have endowments. Endowments are sustainable gifts that you can't give away. You have an endowment. And they include life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We hold the truth of life. Are you holding yours? Are you holding your truth and living with power, with purpose, with passion? We hold the truth of liberty. And I don't mean military personnel stationed all over the world. Thomas Jefferson believed in the liberty of learning and mastering new skills, new ideas, creating. Are you holding the truth of that liberty and that legacy? We hold the truth of a contributory Citizen rape. Ugh. Ben Franklin didn't like that one either. Basically, he said that dog won't hunt. It became the pursuit of happiness. But there is in that an element that each of us participates. That the pursuit is that we are responsible to improve and to perfect. You see, the truth is, the truth is, that the truths we hold grow. The Founding Fathers knew this. The truth that you choose, the ideas, the visions, the emotions, even the fears, what you hold grows. <laughs> of course, the Founding Fathers didn't think that was a secret, or they would have, Ben Franklin would have probably copyrighted it and made a fortune that somebody else did. What you hold in your mind, what you hold in your heart, those things that you put into actions, they become your truth. We hold these truths, it's just four little words, right? 
And I think that there's so much more than just a history lesson. So I'm challenging you to take them out and dust them off. Of course, in mind, they were filed in Sister Bonaventure's fifth grade civics class. Come on, guys, let's bring them up. We hold these truths. It is tempting to think that they're just dusty words from a history lesson. But consider what the Founding Fathers wrote them for. They weren't just pretty prose on parchment. They were a rallying cry. We hold these truths because they were facing a whole new world with conflicting political influences and conflicting ideologies and people who wanted a king in this country. They used these words, these four simple words, to create solutions for the creation of a new country. But in our world, we're facing some pretty, pretty hefty challenges also. I challenge you, face your future, hold your truths. It all starts with four simple words. Contestant number five, Barry Mixon, in the winter of 1992, in the winter of 1992, Barry Mixon. And by the winter of that same year, I was homeless. Yes, I was once homeless. I slept in cars, I slept in abandoned buildings, I slept in alleys, I slept in dumpsters. And if I was lucky, I slept at the Pacific Gardens Mission, which is a shelter in downtown Chicago. And for those of you who have never met a homeless survivor before, let me be the first to tell you that homelessness is a horrific experience. It was the worst year of my life. People look at me today and say, how could you be homeless? Well, what you don't understand is homelessness is not an on and off kind of thing. You don't go to bed one night and wake up homeless, no. Homelessness is a downward spiral. It's a confluence of bad events. It is the perfect storm. I was fine. I had a job. And then because of the economic climate at the time, my hours got cut, so my bills started piling up. And then because I was the last one hired, I was the first one let go. And then I got sick. And then something else happened, and then something else happened, and then something else happened. Until one day I looked up and I realized that the sun just didn't shine anymore. It was dark all the time. See, homelessness is more than the physical act of having a key that you can put into a door and live on the other side. Homelessness is the complete and utter breakdown of everything. Everything you ever knew, everything you ever thought you knew, mentally, physically, and spiritually. And it affects people in different ways. For me, the worst part about being homeless wasn't about being cold all the time. 
or never having enough to eat, or having to think about where I was going to go to the bathroom on a day-to-day -day basis. Man, 14 years in the Marine Corps kind of trained me for that. For me, it was the loneliness. I didn't have anybody to talk to. See, I'm originally from New York, and I don't have any family here. My pride wouldn't let me go back there, so this was it. I was marooned here, like Tom Hanks in that movie Castaway. And what made it really bad was the fact that I didn't even think I could talk to God. I mean, how could I? It's not like I went to his house. And I certainly didn't read his book. So how could I ask God for anything? And I didn't even want him to give me anything. I just wanted to ask him one question. Why? Why was this happening to me? I did all the right things. I went to school. I graduated with three degrees. So why was I sitting in a dumpster and living on the street? I just wanted to know, was there some master plan to all this? <coughs> Days, <coughs> weeks, months passed. I prayed for insanity. Because when you're homeless, you remember everything you ever threw away in your life. That half-eaten sandwich, <coughs> that cold bowl of soup, that old sweater that was just out of style. I longed for a bed. Any bed. It's the memories that kill you. I was at a bookstore once, pretty much at the end of my rope, when I stumbled upon this little tiny book entitled, As a Man Thinketh. And in that book, it said that everything that I needed to change my life was already inside of me. That all I had to do is think about where I wanted to go and do everything in my power towards that end and somehow my life would change. And I don't know if I believe that, but what other choice did I have? I used to envy the guys that could sing and dance because I can't sing and I can't dance. <clears throat> But nobody wants to hear biochemistry from a bum. <laughs> nobody wants to give you a job when you can't fill out the second line of the application. You know the one that says address? But in that book, I found these words. Though your circumstances may be uncongenial, they shall not long remain so if you but perceive an idea and strive to reach it. You cannot travel within and stand still without. Ladies and gentlemen, I read that book each and every day because I needed every fiber of my being to believe <coughs> because I was so tired of being here. I was so tired of the darkness. So, the next time you see a homeless person, whether you give them money or not, please look them in the eye. Remind them of their humanity because they weren't always like that. Once upon a time, they had a job. Once upon a time, they had family and people who loved them. Once upon a time, they had a home. And if you ask any of them, I promise you, they will remember the day, the month, the season, and the year that they were homeless. For me, it was December 16th, and it was in the winter of 1992. God answered my question. <clears throat> it was time to tell you this. Because I'm not the only one. Anyhow, now all of you can say that you know me. Because that is my story. Mr. Toastman.
minute of silence for the judges to mark their ballots. Contestant number six, Kathy Watson, the power of voice, the power of voice, Kathy Watson. Up, I didn't have any role models. 
Mod Pod came to this country at the turn of the century in the 1900s. What did they know about the ambition of Katica? Because we spoke Croatian. Now it came time to face the music. <laughs> I had to go home. I put my shoes on and I would walk home. And closer to the house, this is Rudy what I would hear. Katica! Jesse T. Bila! Dorciano! Yatu Devani Di Stebon! Woo! <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, Ma. Pa. Now, in Croatian, that is <clears throat> very nicely. We're going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a hint. Where have you been? Oh, I was too busy. I would sneak around and go into the house and into the bathroom, <laughs> and I would rinse my feet off to get rid of the red ore, and then forget to rinse out the tub. <laughs> <laughs> my parents were so unique. We were never spanked, but outside the side of the house, now visualize this, this beautiful cherry tree with all of the blossoms. And mom would cut off a twig. And we would get it around our ankles when we misbehaved. That was the extent. I want you to know that my ankles had more twig tapping than <laughs> anyone alive. <sighs> I knew. There was a vision out there for me. And at the age of 11, I was in heaven because I found a form of expression that literally changed my life. Classical ballet. Oh, I knew the terms. Relevé, grand jeté. I was able to develop my voice, my creativity in the world of the classics. I was able to find my voice <coughs> in the world of fashion. Oh, how wonder is the human voice. It is indeed the organ of the soul. I was then able to create even more of the power of my voice that I knew lived in me. I just had to unleash it. In the world of radio, television, and the performing arts. You really think I could hang it on the stage? You bet. So I want all of you to remember that the year 2012 is the year to become more. I want you to unleash the power of your voice. Look out, world. Here we come. Thank you. Contestant number seven, Jerry Evans, LOL, Lottery of Life. LOL, Lottery of Life, Jerry Evans. People often 
talk about, dream about, and pray of the day that they could draw that lucky ticket and how they would spend their riches when they win the million dollar lottery that would change their life. But do we ever think about our lives as if the time we have to live is the big jackpot, the <coughs> lottery? Mr. Contest Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, distinguished dignitaries, and most welcome guests, imagine winning the largest lottery in history, bigger than all the lotteries combined. And the odds of winning this lottery were not 18 million to one, or 20 million to one, or even 120 million to one, but rather one in 400 billion. That's right, billion with a B, bigger than the biggest billionaire's bank accounts. That's pretty steep odds. I've got great news for you. You have in your possession the winning ticket. You didn't have to buy it because it's priceless. It was given to you when you came into this world. At the moment of birth, when you drew your <sighs> first breath, you were given life's golden ticket, your birth certificate. That's right, your birth certificate. You get to play the lottery of life. You won. You won. Each of us is born an original. Yet I think most people don't really appreciate that fact. Not only were you born an original, but when you take into account and add to the package your habits, your taste, your idiosyncrasies, your adventures, your experiences, your talents, skills, and abilities, we uncover a unique individual. There are seven billion people on this planet we share it with. And there will never be another you. Even if we could travel in time to the year 50,000, there would never be another you. That makes you and me, each of us, extraordinary, distinctive, and unique. Life itself is a wonderful prize. Life is an incredible and wild adventure. A gift we sometimes take for granted. I consider myself to be the luckiest guy alive to have received this gift. Maybe because I realize I'm more lucky than most. Because I've had multiple near-death life experiences. Not just one, not just two, but five. Yes, they're more scary and painful than you could ever imagine. But each taught me to see life as a miracle and to value every single day as precious. I just want to focus on the first one because it was so powerful and it happened to me at a tender young age. <coughs> Imagine your father riding out in the fields on a big tractor. I lived on a farm with my aunt and uncle in rural Tennessee for a long time. One of my favorite things to do was riding around on the tractor with my uncle as he pulled various equipment to plow the fields. I loved riding along with my uncle on the tractor, as I had done many times before. All the fun and adventure for a five-year-old boy to be able to help out around the farm. But this one particular day, my uncle was plowing the field, and he was getting ready to make a turn at the end of the row he was plowing, and hit a bump at the same time. Now, my uncle thought it would be safe, so I would sit on the fender of the tractor and hold on to the seat. But as soon as he hit that bump, I lost my hold on the seat, and I fell off the moving tractor. I was helpless and lifeless under the tractor. And to this day, I can still hear the sound of that round, razor-sharp steel blades. Click, 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 as they came toward me. Luckily, my uncle saw me, and he stopped the disc plow he was towing, short of it, slicing and dicing me to bits, like a vegematic. It was the first time in my life I could have been killed 
but beat the odds and survive. See, I didn't know it then, but already so early in my life, I had won another life's golden ticket. When my uncle stopped that tractor, just in time. I could have died, but I carried those experiences with me that have reminded me of the value of my life. But you don't need to have that kind of experience to learn the same lesson, because I'm reminding all of you of it now. We've won this time on earth, and each and every one of us was put here on purpose to make the world a better place, to not hurt people, but to make those people around us happier or better off in some way, to come up with ideas, to climb the red hill, to find your voice. The value of life is not found in material possessions, fame or fortune, or even professional careers, but rather by who you are, not how cool you are. The same way that gold can, the same way that gold can never lose its value. Even if it's in a dumpster covered with dust and trash, likewise you can never lose your value because your intrinsic value is tied to your divine nature. Everything in your DNA is a gift given to you. The lottery of life isn't just that we're born, but that we go on to take advantage of each and every day, that we can get up and make a difference in our own life and in the lives of others. How different would the world be if none of us in this room today had made it past their sixth birthday? Some of us might know people who fall into that category. And how much difference even a life of six years or less can make to those around that person for their entire lives. The lottery of life is both that you are given life and what you choose to do with it each day. There are no losers in the lottery of life. You say you're unlucky? Well, that's not true. In the lottery of life, it's already been you. Mr. Tosin.
Webster. All the ballots have been collected.
know what? I, I also, in your interest and in notable accomplishments, you talk about golf. Do you play frisbee golf? Uh, no, no. The real men's golf.
Which are we? Uh, truth. I've been in Toastmasters for 15 years. A lot has been split through a number of clubs because the club I represent now, AT&T Chicago Line Club, we're going through sad times, but tornado hit our building. And layoffs are inevitable. So, who wants the five foot seventeen person to represent that? <laughs> Tom, I, I got you know, for all of you know we're Kevin. I mean, he's my good friend. He helps me. I ask him for advice all the time. He's always there for me. And um, I want to say thank you because you helped me a lot with my work. And just give me a hand. Together and I'm always in front because I'm short. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't want you to get lost. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Uh, Hank Bergman. Oh, no. 
another motorcyclist. Great. I don't drive a Harley though. I got a really cool Italian Piaggio, so it's like Ooh. the coolest bike. <laughs> <laughs> My wife wants the big Harley though. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Very good. Give him a hand. Thank you. Anything we can look to recognize and celebrate people in their jobs. 
Very good. And do you keep up with all this? I mean, it's, geez, it's a cycling, health, fitness, running, growing, up, moving. Well, that's because, I, that's because I take Kathy's advice. Oh. Except I haven't seen her at the top yet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Let's give Terry a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank
much because 20 years ago, I was in the streets. And to be here, I'm not a particular religious person, but people that believe in miracles, for me to be here today to tell this story in front of all of you, dressed, actually took a bath, things like this, this is a wonderful thing. So thank you so much.